computers are incredibly versatile. They can do a seemingly endless list of things really well. Uh, they can run video games, stream TV shows, play music, browse the internet, write text, draw images, you name it. These things seem like they don't really have anything in common. But the curious thing is, if you break it all the way down to the individual instructions the computer executes, almost everything ends up being an addition. Rendering 3D graphics for a game ends up being a lot of 3D projection calculations, triangle drawing and other linear algebra. Drawing pixels and fonts for a web browser or a text editor is just a lot of 2D linear algebra. Linear algebra itself is just a bunch of additions and multiplications. Decoding video and playing audio requires a lot of signal processing, which in turn is just a ton of fancy maths and additions and multiplications. And fancy maths like logarithms and exponentials can be broken down and approximated with additions and multiplications. And multiplication itself is just a bunch of cleverly arranged additions. Even determining where to jump to in a program to execute the next instruction is an addition. So if everything is addition, how do computers do addition? To get started, let's look at kind of the simplest case. Let's um, add two numbers with just a single digit and see what we can observe about the result. Let's do decimal numbers first, where every digit is anything between zero and nine. Zero plus zero is pretty simple. That's just a zero, a single digit. Um, 2 plus 3, for example, equals 5, which also is just a single digit. 4 plus 5 equals 9, also a single digit. Uh, but something like 6 plus 7 is 13, uh, which makes the result a two-digit number. So what's the largest number we can get from adding two single digits? Well, we add the two largest digits, 9 plus 9, and that is 18. So 9 plus 9 equals 18 is our largest result and uh, 0 plus 0 equals 0 is our smallest result. So when we add two numbers with just a single digit, uh, in the worst case, we get a two-digit number as a result. That's decimal numbers, which we use in everyday life. But computers really love binary numbers, though. So how does this work for binary numbers? Binary is a lot simpler, because each digit can only be a 0 or a 1. So when we add two uh, single binary digits together, there aren't that many combinations. We can actually list them all. So 0 plus 0 in binary is still 0, it's pretty simple. Um, 0 plus 1 in binary is a 1, as you would expect. Uh, 1 plus 0 is also a 1, as you'd expect. Um, but 1 plus 1 equals 2, uh, which in binary is 1, 0. And that already needs a second digit. And that's all the possible cases. Uh, we only have two choices per digit, 0 or a 1, uh, which means that there are only four different combinations of single digit numbers we can add. And We've listed them all here. Let me turn these four combinations into a uh, proper table, and let me also add in uh, the leading zeros for all the single digit results. Now let's think about how we can compute the digits of the result using logic gates, like a computer would do. I'm gonna start with the low bit here, um, Z0, and let me pull up the usual toolbox of logic gates to uh, compare against. If we go through all the truth tables in our toolbox of uh, gates and compare them against what we need for um, the adder, um, that lowest bit looks a lot like an XOR gate. It's zero if both inputs are the same, uh, and one otherwise. Now how about the high bit of the result, the uh, Z1? Um, that high bit looks like an AND gate. It's one if both inputs are one, and zero otherwise. So if we have two single input digits, A and B, uh, we can use an XOR gate to compute the lower digit of the result, and an AND gate to compute the upper digit of the result. Let's give this a shot on a breadboard. All right, I've already combined two uh, breadboards that should give us some room to uh, experiment with. First, we need an XOR gate. Um, for that, we'll use the 74HC86 chip, which has uh, four OR gates. And we need an AND gate. Uh, we'll use a 74HC08 chip for that, which has uh, four of these AND gates. Let's uh, hook up the uh, power and ground. And we'll use a bunch of these uh, bar graph LEDs to look at what inputs we apply to these chips and what comes out the other end as a result. And so since we're uh, trying to do addition, uh, we have a left and right hand side input here uh, where we can show the exact uh, binary digits. And then we have the uh, result over here on the left hand side where we can uh, display what exactly comes out of the adder. And we need a bunch of resistors for the LEDs. And so as we've just seen, to compute the um, lower bit of the result, we want to take the two input bits and feed them into an XOR gate. 
and then the output of the XOR gate gives us the lowest bit of our result. So we take the lowest bit on the right hand side and feed it into um, one of the XOR gates. We take the um, left hand side bit, feed it into the same XOR gate. And then the output of this XOR gate is um, our first result bit. But as we've just seen, uh, in the worst case, we get a second result digit. And to compute that, uh, all we need to do is take the same left and right hand side input bits and feed them into an AND gate, which we have uh, over here. And then the result of that AND operation um, gives us the uh, second bit. So we'll take that bit and uh, feed it into the AND gate. We'll take the other input bit, also feed it into the AND gate. And then the result of the AND operation is going to be our second result bit here. So let's give this a try. First power it up. And then let me connect the uh, inputs. All right, so the left and right hand side input is connected to ground. So we're basically adding a zero to a zero. And as we'd expect, we get a zero uh, at the output. Let's try a zero plus one instead. As you can see, uh, we're adding zero plus one. And indeed, as a result, we get a one. Let's try the other way around. One plus a zero, indeed, uh, returns a one as a result. And if we add one plus one, we do get the two as a result, as we'd expect. So that seems to be working. So all our circuit can do at this point is add two single digits together. Um, but how do we add numbers that have more than one digit? Um, let's look at an example. Say we want to add 345 and 567. My calculator tells me that the result is 912, uh, but let's try to compute that by hand. Now, as you may have learned back in school, you can actually do the addition digit by digit. So let's try to do that. Let's start at the right with the ones place. Um, five plus seven is 12. The two we can write down as the result for the ones place, but the one we don't write down directly, uh, but we'll carry it over into the computation for the next digit. So I'll write it down here at the top so we don't forget it. Now we move on to the next digit, the tens place. Uh, we add the four and the six, and also add that one we carried over from before. So four plus six is 10, plus one is 11. The first one we can write down as the results for the 10th place already. Um, and the second one will carry over into the computation for the next digit. On to the next digit, the 100s place. We add the three and the five and the one we carried over from before. Three plus five is eight, uh, plus one is nine. Um, the nine we write down as the result of the 100s place. Uh, and this time there is no second result digit to carry over. And indeed, that's the 912 my uh, calculator had already come up with. But a computer only works with binary numbers, zeros and ones, as we've seen before. So let's try to do the same thing, uh, but in binary. Let's say we want to add the numbers 11 and 14 in binary. 11 is 1011, and 14 is 1110. We're going to go digit by digit again, from right to left, exactly as we did in the decimal case. So first digit, all the way on the right, uh, one plus zero is one, which we write down as the result for this first digit. And the result doesn't have a second digit that we need to carry over. So next we move to the second digit. Uh, one plus one is two, uh, which is one zero in binary. The zero we write down as the result for the second digit. And the one we're going to carry over into the computation for the next digit. So as before, I'm gonna move the one here to the top so we don't forget about it. And so for the third digit, we add the zero and the one from the uh, two input numbers, and also the one we carried over from before. So zero plus one is one, uh, plus one is two, which is a one zero in binary. The zero again, we write down as the result for the third digit, and the one we carry over into the computation for the next digit. Next up is the fourth digit. We add the two ones from the input numbers, uh, and also that one we carried over from before. So one plus one is two, plus one is three, or one one in binary. The first one we write down as the result for the fourth digit, and the second one will carry over into the computation for the next digit. Now our two input numbers have run out of digits, but we still have that carry. So we just imagine that our input numbers have a zero as their fifth digit. Uh, 
as before, we add those two zeros and also add the one we carried over from before. So zero plus zero is zero plus one is one, um, which is the result we're going to write down for the fifth digit. And there's nothing left to carry over. So let's check if that result is correct. That 11001 in binary we have computed is 25 in decimal and 11 plus 14 is indeed 25. So the result we've computed in binary is correct. That's pretty nice. How did we end up adding these two four digit numbers though? We used one of the coolest problem solving superpowers in computer science. It's called divide and conquer. We didn't know how to add four digit numbers, but we did know how to add single digits. So we took a difficult problem, the four digit numbers, and broke it apart into multiple smaller problems, the one digit numbers, that we actually know how to solve separately. And so to compute a single digit of the result, all we had to do was add three digits two from the input numbers that we're trying to add, and one that was carried over from the previous digit. And then by repeatedly adding the corresponding digits and the carry from before, uh, we were able to compute a larger number. So if we can design a circuit that adds three binary digits, we can compute the addition of any two large numbers simply by feeding them into that circuit digit by digit. So let's go design such a circuit. So we want a circuit that can add three binary digits because this will allow us to basically perform any addition of any big numbers that we want. Since we're working in binary, every digit can only be a zero or a one. Um, and with three digits, that gives us eight different combinations of um, inputs to this addition. So again, we can list them all because eight isn't that big of a number. So let's start out. Adding all zeros is zero. Zero plus zero plus one is one. 0 plus 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 plus 1 is 2, which in binary is 1, 0. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 2, or 1, 0 in binary. 1 plus 1 plus 0 is also 2, so 1, 0 in binary again. And 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, which in binary is 1, 1. And again, to make it easier to come up with a circuit for this, uh, let me turn these eight combinations into a proper table again. And let me fill in the uh, leading zeros for the single digit results again. Okay, so we have this table. This is basically the truth table of our circuit. This is for every combination of inputs, um, the outputs our circuit should produce. Um, but how do we actually convert this into simple gates? Um, things are a bit more complicated now. There are three inputs involved and the pattern in which the output bits are one it isn't really obvious anymore. We basically have two options to turn this truth table into gates. Either we try to use some intuition to look for patterns in the table, massage it a bit and distill out the gates that way. Um, or we use just Boolean algebra and rewriting um, logic equations to do this more systematically. And we can actually do both. Um, let's get started with the first option. Let's start by looking for patterns in the output and try to come up with the gates that way. Let me bring back the toolbox of logic gates so we have something to compare against. And then let's look at the uh, lower bit of our result, z0. This looks like an XOR gate, at least in the upper half of the truth table. And in the lower half, it actually looks like an inverted XOR gate. So just seeing this and how it seems to be related to uh, the XOR operation, adding an XOR gate between B and C seems like a good first guess. So let me add a new column to this table um, with the result of that XOR gate. So it's easier to see and easier to find more patterns. So this new column actually looks good in the upper half of the table where the A input is zero. And in the lower half where A is one, the output just seems to be inverted from what we need. That's the uh, not XOR gate that we were talking about. And when you get to know your way around logic gates a bit, you'll realize that an XOR gate is a convenient way to conditionally invert a signal. When you hold one of the inputs at zero, um, the output of the XOR gate is just whatever the other input is. Uh, and when you hold one of the inputs at one, um, the output is just the other input inverted. So by setting one of the inputs to zero or one, you can actually choose if you want to uh, invert the other input or not. And that's exactly what's going on here. When A is zero, the output Z zero is just the XOR column that we've added. But when A is one, the output Z zero is that column inverted. So from intuition, it would make sense to add another XOR gate, this time between A and that other XOR gate we already have. And that looks pretty good. This column is identical to what we need for the output uh, Z0. 
So let me get rid of this column because it's identical to C0. And let's just write the um, formula we found underneath of C0. Okay, so that's C0 done. Uh, let's move on to the upper bit of our result, Z1. This one looks less obvious. In the upper half of the truth table, when A is 0, it seems to be an AND gate between B and C. And in the lower half, when A is 1, it seems to be an OR gate between B and C. That's kind of wild, but maybe the AND gate in the upper half of the truth table is a good starting point. Let me add a column for that, and let's see what kind of patterns emerge. That doesn't look too bad. It produces some of the ones that we need for Z0, um, specifically this one here and the one all the way at the bottom. But we're still missing these two ones here. Um, these appear only when uh, A is 1, but not when A is 0. So again, it's probably some kind of AND gate here. There's no connection to the inputs B and C that immediately jumps out at me. Um, but looking at that XOR column we've added, it seems like those missing ones appear when both A and that XOR column are 1. So let me add another column for an AND gate between A and that XOR gate. That's not bad, it looks like we're almost there. Um, between these two columns we've added here, uh, we have all the ones we need for our Z1 output. So if we take these two columns and run them through an OR gate, uh, we should basically get the combination of all the ones. And so whenever one of those columns had a 1, um, the um, output of the OR gate here is going to show a 1 and a 0 otherwise. And this looks perfect if we compare this uh, last column we've added to um, the output z1 uh, we can actually see that they're identical so whatever we did to get to this last column here that's exactly the boolean function the combination of gates that we need to compute the output z1 so again let me uh, drop that last column and let me just write down the formula we found underneath uh, z1 and so to quickly recap um, for the output z0 uh, we need two xor gates to compute a XOR B, XOR C. For output C1, we need two AND gates, one to compute B and C, and one to compute A and B, XOR C. Then to get the final result of C1, we need an OR gate to um, compute B and C, or A and B, XOR C. So we figured out a way to compute this truth table from a handful of gates, but it was a lot of guesswork and trial and error. And if the truth table becomes more complicated, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and kind of not really see the patterns that are there. So this intuitionistic approach only works for fairly small um, logic functions that we want to turn into uh, logic gates. To be more systematic about finding the gates to implement this truth table, um, the idea is to convert the truth table into an equation and then use the rules of Boolean algebra to make the equation as simple as possible. Finding the equation for a truth table is actually pretty simple. Uh, in our case, the truth table has two outputs, C0 and C1, so we'll have two equations, one for each of them. Let's start with C0. We go through all the rows where Z0 is supposed to be a 1, and we write down the combination of inputs in that row uh, as an AND operation. So that first one here uh, should appear when A is 0, B is 0, and C is 1. Now, since these are Boolean values that can only be true or false, 1 or 0, um, we can make this a bit more compact by expressing a equals 0 as not a, b equals 0 as not b, and c equals 1 as just c. This AND expression describes the first one we see as a result in the truth table. It is 1 exactly when a is 0, b is 0, and c is 1 and it's zero for all other combinations of the truth table. The AND operation has some similarities with multiplication of you know, regular decimal numbers, but we usually don't write the multiplication symbol when we're dealing with formula. It's customary to do the same thing in Boolean algebra and just not write the AND symbol explicitly. So instead of not A and not B and C, uh, we'll just write not A, not B, C. This is still the AND gate that's just much more compact to write and it's easier to manipulate the formulas like this. And it's easy to think about the AND operation a little bit like a multiplication because a lot of the uh, rules that apply in regular uh, arithmetic for multiplication also kind of apply for Boolean algebra. Let's just keep going. Let's look at the next one in the truth table. It's just the row below. Um, that second one should appear when A is zero or not A, B is one or just B, uh, and C is zero, or not C. Next, the uh, third one should appear when A is one, or just A, B is zero, 
or not B, and C is zero, or not C. And finally, that fourth one should appear when A is one, or just A, B is one, or just B, and C is one, or just C. Now we have these four AND operations here that produce a one for each of the corresponding rows in the truth table and a zero otherwise. And so to get the final equation for z0, we just combine all of them with an OR operation. In a nutshell, the equation says that z0 is a one if not a, not b, and c, or not a, b, and not c, or a and not b and not c, or a and b and c. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward. It was really a mechanical thing. We just wrote down the uh, input combinations. So let's do the same for the other output, C1. Uh, let's do it a bit faster this time. So the output C1 is a one if not A and B and C, or A and not B and C, or A and B and not C, or A and B and C. And so that's it. These are the two equations for our two outputs. And we don't need the truth table anymore because um, these equations are just a more compact way of uh, representing what's in there. And this is called the disjunctive normal form, which basically means an OR expression with a lot of AND expressions inside. Actually, every Boolean equation has a disjunctive normal form, which is a pretty useful property in practice. There's also a conjunctive normal form, which is the exact opposite. It's an AND expression with a lot of OR expressions inside, uh, but we won't need that here. So in practice, whenever you have a truth table or a big complicated Boolean function, uh, you can always bring it into this disjunctive normal form where it's just a big OR gate with a lot of AND expressions inside. And the intuition is that each AND expression describes some of the ways of how the output can become a one, and then the OR gate just sums up all those ways and combines them together. One of the downsides of the disjunctive normal form is that the equations aren't really efficient at the moment. To implement this with logic gates, we would need eight three input AND gates and two four input OR gates to compute the results here. So that's 10 gates in total. And you might not be able to find three input and four input gates that easily. It's much more common to have uh, two input uh, logic gates. So if we only have two input AND and OR gates available, we'd need 28 of these two input gates in total just to compute these two um, expressions. But this is just the starting point. We aren't done yet. We can use the basic rules of Boolean algebra to optimize this expression and simplify it such that it requires uh, fewer logic gates to actually implement in practice. I'm not going to make a complete list of the rules of Boolean algebra here, um, but check out the link in the description if you want to uh, have a few more details on that. Um, but I'm going to list a few interesting ones that we can uh, use here. The first useful rule is called the complement of the OR operation. And it basically says that x or with uh, not x is just a one, because either x is true, then the left-hand side is true, or x is false, then the right-hand side of the OR is true. So in any case, either the left or the right-hand side will be true, so the uh, entire OR gate will always be true. Then also useful is the identity of the AND operation, which is basically saying that if you AND something with a, a constant one, um, you can leave the entire AND operation away because the one doesn't change um, the result. So X and one is just X in practice. There's also an AND complement and an OR identity, um, if you're curious. Another useful one that you might know from regular algebra is distributivity. If you see x and y or x and z somewhere, uh, you can actually take this x and factor it out, pull it out of the expression and put it in front of everything, such that you get x and y or z and y or z is in parentheses. And as you can see, this simplifies the expression. Uh, you don't need the two AND gates and an OR gate, you just need one AND gate and one OR gate. And since we can pretty easily find XOR and not XOR gates in, in practice, um, it's worth taking a look at how you would express the XOR gates um, just with AND and OR operations. So a not XOR gate basically tells you if the two inputs are the same. So either X and Y are both false or X and Y are both true. And then the XOR gate is just the opposite. It's basically telling you if the two inputs are not equal. So either X is false and Y is true or x is true and y is false. Okay, so that's the rules we'll try to use. 
It's pretty useful to understand why they're true and why they exist, but if all you want to do is simplify such an expression, you also can just not care about why these individual rules are true. All you're doing is you're looking for these patterns in these rules and trying to um, replace them uh, with the other side of the uh, quality sign. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Uh, let's go to town on the equation for z0 first. So as a starting point, uh, let's look at this not a that's present in the first two terms here. We can apply the distributivity rule here and just pull out this not a factor and put it in front of uh, the rest in parentheses. Pretty much the same as you would do with uh, addition and multiplication in uh, regular algebra. And in a similar fashion, there's this a that's present in the last two terms. So we can apply the distributivity rule again to factor out the a uh, and put the b and c's in parentheses. All right, so that's a and not a factored out. Um, now it would be great if we could do something about the stuff in the parentheses, the b's and c's here. In the first parentheses, there's a not b and c or b and not c. So the expression is one if either b is zero and c is one or b is one and c is zero. That's an XOR gate. So let's apply the XOR rule here and rewrite this as b XOR c. The second parentheses are similar. There's a not b and not c or b and c. So the expression is one if either both b and c are one or both b and c are zero. That's the inverted XOR gate. Uh, so let's apply the not XOR rule here and rewrite this as uh, b not XOR c. All right, so that looks pretty good already. Now what we're left with is an OR gate with two terms. On the left-hand side, there's a not a and an XOR gate. And on the right-hand side, there's a a with an inverted XOR gate. And this is actually yet another XOR gate. Either a is zero and b x or c is one, or a is one and b x or c is zero. So we can apply the XOR rule again here and rewrite the whole thing as a x or b x or c. All right, pretty neat. So that original equation for z zero, which had all these terms, um, turned out to be just two XOR operations, uh, which we've already seen when we did the uh, intuitionistic approach. Um, I don't really see any other way how we can further rewrite or simplify this. So um, let's consider z0 done and move on to the equation for z1. Let's start by trying to factor out a few common terms again. Um, for example, there's this bc in the first and last terms. So let's apply distributivity again and factor out the bc from these terms and just pull it in front of some parentheses. Pretty nice. And inside of the parentheses that leaves uh, not a or a. And this expression is always true, as we've uh, discussed before. If a is zero, the left-hand side is true, and if a is one, the right-hand side is true. So whatever the value of a is, one side of the OR expression is true, and so the overall OR uh, operation is always true. And we can replace the entire expression in parentheses with just a1. All right, so that first AND expression here is b and c and 1. And just like adding zero to something doesn't change the result and multiplying something with one doesn't change the result, adding something with one doesn't change the result. So this um, and identity rule that we've discussed before, we can apply here. Uh, we can just leave the one away and just write B and C. And it's gonna be the same as B and C and one. Okay, that looks pretty good. Um, let's try to factor out some more stuff. Um, in the last two terms, there's this um, A here. So let's apply distributivity uh, again and factor out the A and move um, the B's and C's into parentheses. And now we're left with this not B and C or B and not C in parentheses here. And by now this looks quite familiar and this is just an XOR gate between B and C. So let me rewrite this as B XOR C. All right, then I don't really see any other rules that uh, we can apply here. Now that we've made both of the equations as small as possible, um, we can actually look at them together and see if they share any terms. And in fact, this b x or c here appears in both of the expressions. So we can just pull this out um, as an intermediate result and we can compute it once with one x or gate and then use it for both uh, z0 and c1. All right, so these are the optimized expressions. Uh, now the question is, are they actually more efficient than what we started out with, the two big and or uh, disjunctive normal form expressions? Let's quickly do the math. Uh, we need two two input XOR gates, we need two two input AND gates, and one two input OR gate. So five gates in total um, to compute Z0 and C1. And if you recall, the unoptimized version that we just uh, you know, transcribed the truth table into, um, that required a whopping 28 gates in total. 
All right, so that looks like a very efficient way of implementing that truth table. And what's also promising is that the resulting gates we get here, um, they're actually pretty much what we came up with the previous approach where we looked at a truth table and tried to massage it a bit and use intuition to come up uh, with the expressions. But the nice thing about this approach here is that it's, it's very systematic and mechanical. It doesn't require a lot of intuition and, and prior experience to just find patterns and, and optimize expressions that way. Kind of the takeaway point here is if you, if you have a truth table, you can always find the disjunctive normal form, no matter how complicated truth table or the Boolean expression is. Um, this gives you an equation that you can immediately build from just AND and OR gates. The, the downside is that the equations aren't really in an ideal form yet, and you'll use a lot of AND and OR gates in practice. Um, but you can apply the rules of Boolean algebra and try and rewrite the equations into more efficient forms. So let's turn this into a schematic that we can actually build up on the breadboard. We have three single digit inputs, A, B, and C. And then let's start by using an XOR gate um, to compute this intermediate result um, X here. With another XOR gate, we can already compute the uh, lower bit of the result. And then we use two AND gates to compute B and C and A and X. And then we feed the outputs of those AND gates into an OR gate to compute the final upper bit of the result. Now remember how the previous circuit looked like, the one that added just two um, binary digits together. Um, these XOR and AND gate pairs here are, are basically that circuit. And these are commonly called half adders. They're half adders because if you put two of these together with an OR gate at the top like we just did, you get a full adder that has three input digits. And as we've seen before, being able to add three single digits is everything you need to compute arbitrarily large additions. Now I know going from the truth table to Boolean equations to logic gates looks cumbersome and very tedious, but don't despair, it actually is tedious. Coming up with a good arrangement of gates that implements a truth table or a Boolean function is very, very hard. In fact, it, it's one of the core problems in computer science that is known to be very hard indeed. And it's also very challenging for a computer to, to do this because there's just so many different combinations and ways how we can put logic gates together. There are software tools out there that can do this gate level synthesis for you if you give it a description of what your circuit should do in some form of Boolean expression or truth table. Now, some of these tools are open source, um, but if you are Intel or Nvidia and you're, you're building digital circuits for a living as a big company, um, there are some very expensive commercial tools that do exactly this kind of work for you. And you probably want to pay for those if you're such a big company. All right, but enough equations and talking. Let's actually put this on a breadboard and see it in action. Let me add the LED for the third input. And we'll connect it to zero for the moment. To make the addition work with this uh, third input bit here, uh, we have to rearrange things. For starters, uh, once we've taken these um, two input bits and fed them into an XOR gate, we need another XOR gate that takes this result and XORs it with the uh, third input bit. And then the output of that second XOR gate becomes our new uh, lowest result bit. And now as we've just seen before, uh, similar to the first XOR gate where we um, took both of the inputs and also fed it into an AND gate to detect the condition when both inputs were one, uh, we need to do the same thing for the second XOR gate. So we'll take um, the two inputs of the second XOR gate and feed them into an AND gate to detect when both of them are one. But now we have uh, two signals here that indicate whether we need a second uh, result bit, uh, one from each AND gate. And what we want to do is we want to set the um, second bit of the result if either of those is a one. So basically we need to do an OR operation between the two AND gate results. And no surprise there, we're going to use a 74HC32 chip for that, uh, which is a chip which has four OR gates in it. And then all we need to do is take the um, outputs of the two AND gates we have and feed them into one of the OR gates. And now all that's left to do is um, take the second result bit uh, from the output of this OR gate. Let's see if that works. So we still have the left and right hand side inputs as before, but now we have this third input down here. And indeed we're adding zero plus zero plus zero, and as we'd expect, the result is a zero. So let's see if the uh, simple addition from before still works if we keep this uh, third input at zero. So if we're computing zero plus one, we do get a one as a result, as expected. 
and a 1 plus 0 uh, is still a 1. And then a 1 plus 1 produces the 2 that we would expect. All right, so that's the four um, cases with this third input uh, set to 0. Let's now set it to 1. And this already looks very promising. We're adding 0 plus 0 plus 1, and indeed the result is a 1. If we're adding 0 plus 1 plus 1, the result is indeed 2, as you'd expect. And if we're adding 1 plus 0 plus 1, the result is also 2, as you'd expect. But now if we're adding 1 plus 1 plus 1, we do get the 3 um, that we would expect. So this thing is called a full adder because it produces all the values from 0 to 3 that you can fit into a 2-bit uh, number. And it takes three inputs and produces all the correct combinations of um, additions you can do with uh, three single-bit inputs. And in fact, because it's three inputs, we have eight different combinations that we can um, apply to the adder. And we just tried all eight of them and they produce the correct result at the output. Now let's think about how we can build an adder that can add two bit values. So two left hand side bits plus uh, two right hand side bits. And in fact, the uh, full adder we've built up here only utilizes the lower half of the chips. So we can build a second full adder um, for the um, second bit that we want to add um, uh, in the other half of the chips. So let me duplicate all this wiring on the uh, other side of the chips. We'll take the second um, right hand side bit and the second left hand side bits. Then we need to take the output of this first XOR gate and uh, feed it into the second XOR gate. Then we also have the third input bit, which uh, in the other full adder we've uh, displayed on this um, LED here. But um, let me just pull this to ground for the other adder for now, like so. Then we also want to bring the uh, XOR inputs over to the AND gates to detect the case where we need a uh, second result bit. And that again produces two outputs here at the um, AND gates, which indicate if um, any of the XORs on the right hand side require a second output bit to be set. And so we again want to feed this into an OR gate to get a single second output bit. All right, that second full adder that we've just built will produce another two result bits that we can display here on the LEDs. So let me just connect them up somewhere. And so what we have is um, two independent full adders here um, that take the left and the right hand side and they produce um, two independent two bit results. The first full adder produces its result in the uh, rightmost two bits, and the second full adder produces it in the leftmost two bits. So let's see if this works. All right, so the first bit should work just as before. That looks pretty good. But now let's test the um, second input bit, uh, which we've wired up to the second full adder. So right now we're adding a zero and a zero, which gives us a, a zero here on the uh, second output. And if we add a 0 plus a uh, 1 bit here, uh, we get a 1 at the output. Same if we add a 1 plus a 0, we get a 1 at the output. And then if we add a 1 plus a 1, uh, we do get a 2 at the output. And then the third input is up here. Uh, we don't have an LED for that, but if I um, turn that to a 1, we get the uh, 3 at the output um, that we would expect. Now recall how we did addition by hand, where we um, added the two numbers digit by digit, and then we had this carry bit that we carried forward from uh, previous bits. So for example, if we um, add one plus one at the input, um, we get a two as a result. And how we dealt with this when we did manual addition is we um, wrote down this first bit here, zero in this case, as the result. But then the second bit, we didn't write into the result, but we said this was the carry bit. And we factored it into the addition of the um, next digit of the result. And that's the beautiful part about these full adders, um, the fact that they have three single bit inputs. Um, we can take um, two of the bits from the actual number we want to add, and then the third bit we can just say is the carry from the um, previous bits that we've added. And if you recall, our second full adder has this third input unused. It's currently tied to, uh, to zero, and I can make it one to uh, increase the output by one. 
And so the clever bit now is to take this um, second output bit, which is called the carry bit, because we want to carry it over um, to um, the next position of the, of the result, to take this and use it as the uh, third input of the second full adder, such that when we add the um, second bits, uh, we uh, take into account if the previous bit produced a carry that we need to um, add on top of everything else. And so we're going to take the second result bit of the um, first adder and we're going to feed it into that other input of the next adder. So 0 plus 0 still 0. That's all good. And then we can turn this into a 0 plus 1. That gives us the 1 as a result. That is still good. But then when we add 1 plus 1 here, um, you can see that we get a 1 0 out of the first full adder. But now we're also taking that carry bit and feeding it into uh, the second full adder, which displays its result up here. And now the trick is to actually not display this uh, second result bit of the um, first full adder here, because it's just the intermediate carry bit and it doesn't really show up in the result. It just factors into the addition of the next. It just factors into the result uh, in the next position of the addition. So let me just rip that out. And now with that moved over, we're actually getting the correct result of adding those two two-bit numbers here. If you recall, in the worst case, uh, addition will produce one additional bit. If the inputs are too large, you might get uh, another bit set in the, in the result. And indeed, we have um, two input bits here on the left and right hand side. And then our result is actually three bits wide. It's one additional bit because the addition of the two inputs can actually overflow and produce a third bit, which is what you see here. So let's give this a quick try to uh, get a feel for it. Zero plus one is a one. And 0 plus 2 is a 2. And the same holds if we use the other input. 1 plus 0 is indeed 1. And 2 plus 0 is indeed a 2. But now if we add a 1 plus a 1, we get a 2 as a result. But what happens in the background is that the full adder, which computes the um, first uh, digit of the result, it takes the first input digits, the 1 and the 1, it sums them up produces a 2. Um, the 2 is a 1, 0 in binary. The 0 gets um, produced as a result immediately, and the 1 gets fed into the second full adder as a carry bit. And then that uh, full adder takes the uh, second bits of the input, which is a uh, 0 and 0 in this case, and adds 0 plus 0 plus the carry, um, which was a 1, uh, and produces the result here. And similarly, if we have a 1 plus a 2, uh, we do get a 3 at the output. But if we turn this into a 1 plus a 3, we indeed get a 4 at the output. And what happens internally is that 1 plus 1 in the least significant bit here um, overflows and produces a carry bit. And then that carry bit is added um, to the second bits here, which is a 0 plus a 1, uh, and produces a 2 at the output. So that itself produces a carry bit, which is why we get a 4 as a result here. And note that we still have this uh, third input of the very first um, full adder. And since this is similar to how we accepted a carry bit um, in this third input for the second full adder, this is generally called the carry input of the adder. Because this is just another single bit input that uh, we can leave at zero, nothing happens, but we can set it to one. And what it does is it just adds a one to the overall result of the addition. And in fact, these full adders and the chaining of this um, carry output of um, the previous adder to the carry in um, the third port of the next adder is all you need to build arbitrarily uh, large um, adder circuits. So to demonstrate that, uh, what we can do is we can take these two full adders and duplicate them and turn it into four full adders. And we can wire them up in a way such that they implement um, four bit addition. We need another XOR chip, another AND chip, and another OR chip. The OR chip is technically not needed because we only use two gates here, but it just makes for a very um, symmetrical uh, mirror image, which is kind of nice to work with. So we're going to take the um, third um, bits of the right and left hand side and bring them over um, to one of the XOR gates. And then we'll do um, the exact same wiring as we did over here.
Okay, and that uh, third full adder produces the third bit now. And the uh, thing we used as the uh, third bit before uh, was in fact the um, carry output of the um, second full adder. So we're gonna feed that carry out of the second full adder to the carry in of the third full adder. And then the fourth bits of the left and right hand side, they get connected um, to the inputs of the fourth full adder up here. And then the rest of the wiring is gonna be exactly the same. Now the uh, fourth bit of the result is produced by the um, fourth full adder. And we're gonna connect the carry input of the fourth full adder to the carry output of the third, such that the carry bit gets propagated uh, long. And then we can actually display the carry out of the um, last full adder here, of the fourth full adder, um, and display that as just another um, result bit. These wires are just so we can set the uh, inputs to some value. There we go. To make it easier to read, let me tape off the unused bits here on the bar graph LEDs. So this is an adder. We're um, dealing with um, four bit inputs and we're producing a five bit result in the worst case. So let's give this a try. And so as you'd expect, zero plus zero uh, is a zero. Zero plus a one results in a one. One plus one results in a two, as you would expect. And if we set the carry input of the overall adder, it's a one plus one plus one, which is a three at the output, um, as you would expect. If we do a one plus two, uh, we get a three at the output, also as you would expect. And let's try a one plus three. One plus three gives you a four at the output. Next up, three plus three is indeed six. That seems to be uh, working. And if we set the overall carry input, um, it becomes a three plus three plus one, uh, which is a uh, three plus three is a six, plus the one is a seven. And indeed, seven is what we see at the uh, output. Let's try to exercise the um, second set of full adders a bit more. Let's do a four plus four, which uh, indeed is eight. And we can get the uh, same result if we turn this four into a five. And instead we add it to a three. What happens internally is the um, first bit here is added, that's a one plus one, um, that produces a zero as a result, but um, has a carry. And then the next bit, it's a zero plus one plus that carry bit, which is set, which is a two. So that produces a zero as a result and sets the carry again. And then in the third position, it's a one plus zero plus that carry bit that was set. Um, and so that's another um, two. So the result is a zero and the carry bit is set. And then in the fourth position, we're adding zero plus zero plus that carry bit that was set. And that is exactly the one uh, you see as a result. Let's see if we can produce um, a larger result. For example, we could add nine plus six, and that indeed um, gives us 15, which is um, all four bits set. And indeed, that's the uh, largest number uh, we can represent in four bits. It's a number 15. So if instead of adding nine plus six to give us 15, we added um, nine plus seven, we indeed see the whole thing overflow and the next bit gets set, which is the carry output, uh, and all the lower four bits um, are cleared to zero. And let's see what's the uh, largest result is that we can get if we set all the bits here in the input. That's a 15 plus a 15, which indeed is a uh, 30 at the output. And we can even add one more to that by setting the overall carry input. And now it's a 15 plus a 15 plus a one. And that indeed um, is a 31, which is um, five bits set. So what we've built here from six uh, separate chips is a full four bit adder. It can add two four bit numbers plus a carry input, and it produces a four bit result plus an additional carry output. And what this allows you to do is if you had another copy of this breadboard, uh, you could build an eight bit adder where the um, carry out of one of the adders um, is just going to feed the carry in of the next adder. 
And so if any of the lower bits produced a carry in their addition that you need to consider for the upper bits, it will flow through that connection. And then the uh, upper four bits uh, would uh, properly consider that carry and produce the correct um, result. And in fact, this arrangement here is so useful as a building block that you can buy chips off the shelf that basically contain this exact circuitry um, inside of them. This is the 74HC283 chip, which is a 4-bit adder, which we've already used in the program counter to increment the program counter and implement chumps. It has a left and right-hand side input, uh, 4 bits each. It produces a 4-bit result, and it has a carry input and a carry output pin. So it's exactly this circuit. And so instead of building uh, adders from all these discrete components, we can use um, this 283 chip here um, to build an adder for, uh, for a CPU and actually make it do useful work for us. And that's exactly what we're going to look at in the next episode. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of this and uh, see you next time.